tonight we're going to discover the Hebrew alphabet again, but in a totally different way than we normally do. We've been working our way through the Hebrew alphabet, the original language of Yahweh, and been showing the depth of it that is overwhelming how it relates to your life as a believer. We showed, we've, we're, we worked our way through over half of the alphabet showing that every letter is a picture in its original 4,000 year ago Paleo-Hebrew form, and every picture has a meaning and a spiritual meaning behind it and a, a number, because in Hebrew, numbers are letters and letters are numbers and how it relates to you in your life. And so I, I, didn't, I don't think I threw up the, uh, yes, I did. So we'll go through it real quickly. We'll do a quick review. For those of you that have never been here before, or you haven't been caught up to our Hebrew class, it's been really impactful. We've had a lot of feedback, a lot of emails from it, and people waiting for this to get done so that they can get the whole set. But it starts off like this. Aleph is an ox head 4,000 years ago. It's just like uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, except they're Hebrew. And it means strength or the head of strength of the head of. Bait is a house. Gimel is a rich man who is full of good pride, not bad pride. He's proud that he can give to the next one, the Dalit, which is the open door, which is the poor man. Hay is a guy that jumps up and down. It means revelation or revealed. Vav is the nail, the nail of Messiah. It connects. Zion is the sword of the spirit. It goes deep inside the earth, your earth, separates bone and marrow, and it creates a separation. Out from that separation comes the next letter, which is chet, which is a fence. The fence is there to protect you. It's the same fence that went around the, 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 the uh, Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. That fence had canvas, and it had uh, pillars, which represent the Torah, or the instructions of Yahweh, that, and it was a, a beautiful picture, if you know anything about the tabernacle, uh, that is, the whole thing is a picture of if you stay inside the fence, the boundaries that God set in your life, He will protect you because His presence is inside that fence. If you choose to go outside of the fence, you're on your own. The next letter is the letter Tet. We'll talk about that one tonight. It's a snake in the basket. It's a letter of decision. Yod is the first letter in God's name. Isn't it strikingly amazing that over 90% of, of believers today that say they serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob cannot even tell you how to spell his name or even know it, much less the name of his son. And maybe you're, you're watching for the very first time, so let me explain myself. His name is Yahweh, yod Hey vav Hey. Every time you see L-O-R-D capitalized in your Bible, there's a reason why it's capitalized, because it's a proper name. It's the Hebrew name, Tetragrammaton, yod Hey vav Hey Yahweh. His son's name is Yeshua, which means salvation. It's a short form of Yehoshua, which is Joshua. And for a cool tidbit uh, that I've given for free before, there's a reason why Joshua led them into the promised land and not Moshe. Not Moses, because it was a foreshadowing for all those that would read their Bibles to understand the name of the Messiah, because the, the, the name of the Messiah was going to be Joshua, because Joshua led them in the promised land the first time, it was going to be Joshua that was going to lead them in the promised land the second time, Yeshua, salvation. Translated is transliterated into Greek as Jesus, and then English as Jesus. The next one is Kof. Kof, you can see, if you look down from the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, you see the cherubim. That's exactly what it is. It's actually cherubim, a cherubim, and it, Kof means anointed. It's the hand that anoints. Lamed is the letter that stands higher above all letters because it represents instruction or a staff or a rod of authority. It is the Torah. It is the middle letter of the alphabet that says, I am I touch both sides. I am the beginning. I am the end. I'm the Aleph. I am the Tav. I am the Torah. I am the instructions. I stand high because I am the Word of God, and I will come and become flesh. Okay? He's the center point. Yeshua is clearly the center heart of God. Mem is the, uh, is the womb. It's the open womb. Of, uh, it creates water. Water bursts forth like Noah's flood and destroyed the earth. Was that a bad thing or a good thing? Depends on whether you're in the boat or not, I suppose. <laughs> okay? Water can be, a, can be a bad thing. It can be a good thing. If you are washed in the water of the Word, 
on this earth, as you bend the knee to Yeshua, it's a really good thing. Like Yeshua says, if you stumble over the stumbling stone too late, it will crush you. Okay? So the water washes you, which is incredible because the next letter is the letter noon, which means life, like a plant or a seed or even a sperm is the picture 4,000 years ago that brings forth life. And we talked about Samic. Samic is the staff that you lean on. It's support. It means you're something that you support. Whatever you're supporting. What's supporting you today? What are you, what are you leaning on? Are you leaning on people? They'll eventually let you down. What word of God are you leaning on? Well, that's strange. Why would you say that? Do you lean on a little bit of the word of God or all of the word of God? Stick around at Passion for Truth long enough, you'll find out what that means. We believe in the whole word. Why? Because nothing else will hold you up. The Old Testament is simply the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is simply the Old Testament revealed. Without it, neither one exists. Ion, once you lean on the right thing, you lean on the Word of God, you have eyes, spiritual insight. It illuminates things. Pay is the mouth, the spoken mouth. And that's what we left off with. So I'll go back through this and tell the story. It is the head, the strong head of the house who is rich, who gives to Dalit the poor man, which brings revelation of the nail and the sword of the spirit that breaks your life wide open and brings up the instruction manual that brings you to a decision. And once you make the right decision, you are given the right hand fellowship of Yahweh, the power of God. He anoints you to teach the instructions of God that bring forth water into people's life, that brings forth abundant life, that allows them to have true support, true insight, and speak life from their, from their mouth. This is why the Hebrew alphabet is so important. So we're going to back up. The Holy Spirit has told me that I need to go back through Tet. I don't think you put the right one on here. So make sure you check. I'll recheck this because I don't think that's right. But we're going to go back through Tet. This is Lamed. If you weren't here, maybe you have a photographic memory. You'll get more out of this than most. Yeah, this is the wrong PowerPoint. That's okay. He'll fix that for me real quick. It's my cue to go off the grid again. <laughs> this will be the longest service of all time. All right. There's been quite a few PowerPoints and quite a few letters that we've gone through. And I've touched on Tet multiple times. But what has dawned on me is that I never actually taught on the fullness of Tet. So I'm going to take 10 minutes. 15 minutes at the most, and I'm going to go through this letter because it is the fulcrum point of your life. And it's so apropos that we're going to talk about this tonight, especially from what I just went through that I shared with you earlier. The letter Tet, you're looking at the modern letter Tet here today. It's Gematria's nine. What does that mean? It's the ninth letter. It means number nine. If you write nine in Hebrew, you're going to write this letter, and it's number nine, Okay. The meaning of nine. Let's go in a little depth of the meaning of nine. Nine is the number of judgment, okay? The finality of things. Basically, it's used when judging man or his works, okay? The nine months of pregnancy. Do you think that God could have made a baby fully formed in four months? I mean, for crying out loud, he makes mosquitoes like almost overnight. You know what I mean? <laughs> All kinds of animals that do this. Why did he choose mankind to have a gestation period of nine months? Or 40 weeks, the number of tribulation. Because he's sending spiritual messages that it must go through nine months because nine months after nine months, after 40 weeks, there is judgment. Life or death. Life comes after judgment. And you might say judgment, that's really strong. That's weird. How, how can you, I mean, that, that's a kind of a strange definition of judgment. How many know that judgment is testing? And if you know anything about a, a child in the womb, you know that every moment of its life in the womb is nothing but a test of strength. 
They only get stronger because of the testing that's going on. How many know the same thing with a cocoon and a butterfly? They only become a butterfly because of the testing that's going on inside of them. Try helping out a butterfly by opening up the cocoon and see if it lives. It will die. It will have no strength in its wings because that's where it gets its strength from is in the struggle. Why do you think James says consider pure joy to face trials of many kinds? Because you are in a cocoon in this earth. And without the struggles that you and I go through, we will never reach our full potential of what God has called you to be. In this last couple of days, if I would not have gone through the struggles that I went through, I would not be able to speak to you today from that regard. I would not be stronger. I would not learn the difference between the enemy's voice and Abba's voice. I don't want to just know Abba's voice. Why? Because the enemy can imitate it according to the scriptures. I want to know both so that I can hear the slight difference between the two. First time that Tet is found in the scriptures is Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. It says, and God saw the light, and it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. Anybody know what the Hebrew word for good is? They wake up and say, good morning. What do I say? Boker tov. Okay? Morning good. Good morning. Good is tov. And so it's very interesting because the, the letter, to, the letter uh, 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 Tet can go both ways. It's interesting because this is the ancient pictograph that you would see on a rock or something in Israel. It's tet. It's a circle with an X in it, okay? And it means choice. It means uh, it can be like a, like a basket. It's like you're looking down on a basket, okay? And inside the basket can be a snake. So some of the meanings, it represents a basket or a snake. It can be surround or the concealed potential good. It can go both ways. You can, it's like opening up a basket like they do this in India, you open up the basket and the, and the big king cobra comes out, and one of two things are going to happen. Either that king cobra is going to strike you and get you right here and kill you, or you're going to stare that thing right in the eye and you're going to charm it and it's just going to cower in your presence. So this is the letter of decision. When you come to a decision point, a brick wall, not a speed bump, a brick wall, and you need to make a choice Hebraically, you're in the letter Tet. It is the most incredible, most exciting, and scariest place to be on the Hebrew alphabet because it hinges between good and evil. It hinges between literally being stuck in the basket with the snake and being bit like Eve was. Eve was on the letter Tet when the snake came up. She had two trees before her, did she not? The tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. If she chose rightly, she would live. If she did not, she would die. That was letter Tet. It was the, liter, the literal place of decision. It was too like a fork in a road. You can almost even see the snake's head and the way that the, the letter is created to look even like a snake. It's there waiting for you. And let me tell you something, if you've never heard any of these things before, maybe you've never heard anything about uh, the front of the book or the Torah or the or, or Hebraic understanding of the faith, let me just share something with you. We've been deceived into thinking that Hasatan, that God has no power over Hasatan. Now you may say, well, no, I, I believe that, that he has full power over him. But do you believe that God actually can send an evil spirit to test you? Because I can show you scriptures where he does. Because some of you, that messes with your theology. He uses evil, not creates evil. He uses evil so that you can become stronger. Like he uses wind to make a tree's roots stronger. It's the same way. It's the same thing. The enemy will roam around you. He will push up against you. Did you know that the scriptures say that if you are righteous, every step is ordained? Every one of your steps is ordained. So let me ask you a question. When you stepped in that pothole, did God just not see it coming? When he let something horrible happen to you, was he sleeping? Was it from the Lord? 
or did he use the enemy to bite your heel for a purpose like he did me? Maybe you need to be woke up. Maybe there's something in your life that you need to look at that you need to see. Maybe there's something generational that you're deceived and you don't even know you're deceived. How many know when you're deceived? It's the very definition of it. This is why it's so critical to be in covenant with one another. Because you can't see your back. And your spouse won't always see perfectly. We need one another. Do you know the letter Ted is made up of two letters? Almost every Hebrew letter has two letters built into it. If you know your Hebrew alphabet, you'll see it. It's made up of the Vav and the Zion. The Zion is very easy to see. It's on the left-hand side. The Vav is on the right-hand side. And so what you have is we have this. You have the Vav, which represents man or the nail. In this case, Yeshua, obviously. And uh, the Zion, which represents the sword, the plow, or a crowned Vav. It's a crowned Vav or the crowned Messiah, the crowned man. So what you have is you have the nail, or excuse me, the man or the nail is bowing to the crowned man. This is a hint inside of the letter telling you how to get to Yod. Sounds a little bit like Raiders of the Lost Ark, doesn't it? How do I navigate to the Ark of the Covenant? Why does everybody want the Ark of the Covenant? I'm going to submit to you that everyone wants the Ark of the Covenant in the physical realm. But Yahweh has put it in our hearts to, to try to find the Ark of the Covenant for one reason, and we're not seeing it in the spiritual realm. Why does man want the Ark of the Covenant? What are they going to do with it? It's a box. Because he put it inside of every man's heart to bow to the throne of God, to come to the throne. And the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. It is the place where Yahweh sat and his glory was unveiled. He wants all mankind to come to him. And the only way that you can come to him, because you know what the next letter is after Tet, is Yod. And Yod is the right-hand power of God. It is the first letter in his name. No man comes to the Father except through the crowned man, the Son. And it is at that decision where you either bow to the crowned man or you will bow to the head of the snake. Your choice. Either you will have the right-hand fellowship of the power of Yahweh in your life or you will literally be grabbing the head of the serpent and you won't know it. Because Hasatan deceives and he's really good at it. You must make the right choice. What choice? Whatever's in front of you for right now. You say, Jim, I'm just learning this whole commandments thing, and I'm trying to learn all this and, and keeping the Shabbat. And so do what he puts before you right now. In love through the Spirit of Messiah, do what you can to please your daddy. Because the journey of the alphabet never ends. It's a mountain spiral. When you do it right, it's a spiral. There's only one mountain. Don't be deceived. People say, I'm going around the same mountain. I am too. I just hope to be going up the mountain every time I go around it. I don't want to go on that same trail. You see the same tree? That's scary. You want to see a different tree as you go up, so on and so forth. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says, As I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. Remember that part in, uh, anybody seen the movie Ice Age? If you have children, you've seen it. If not, you should see it. It's a good cartoon movie. There's a part in there where, with Sid the Sloth. I should have put this in my video clip for my message. And they asked him a question. I think the lion was after him or the tiger or something like that. And he asks him a question, and Sid says, no, I choose life. He knew what was best when his back was up against the wall. Some of you, your back is up against the wall right now. What will you choose? Will you choose to submit to the spirit of anger or bitterness that's in your life? Or whatever it is. And I don't care who you are. 
every one of us have had to deal with bitterness. The deception is believing that you don't. Last week, we had a young woman stand on stage and give a prophetic word from the Lord that people are struggling in bitterness, and if you do not let go of your anger, it will destroy you from the inside out. And the deception is, is you won't even see it, which is why you must be in covenant. So Abba says, on the mountain, I set before you blessings and curses. It's your choice. Moses has a staff of God in his hand. They walk through this narrow valley and they end up at the Reed Sea. Two and a half million people behind him and an Egyptian army that is on its way and closing in fast. If there's anybody that had the right to say, this was not fair, why are you leading me down this road? Only to die. You see, the people said it, but you don't think Moses thought it? Some of you have been led down roads that you have come to conclusion ends in destruction. What you need to do is you need to do what Moses did. Moses made the right choice because the very first thing he did was he turned to the Father in prayer and said, now what? And Father gave him instructions. With the power and rod of his authority, the people that were in covenant, he raised that rod and there was a what? A parting of the sea, supernatural way out of that destructive pathway and they had a choice. Now you might say, well, this is a pretty easy choice. Really? You want to look up at 150 foot of water on both sides as most of, uh, of your family member is, is passed out on the, on, on the ground from watching it happen? <laughs> it's not quite that easy of choice. Because in my mind, I might be thinking, if I go back and plead for my life, I can go right back into my house, I could serve Pharaoh, and I could have steak ribeye tonight. I don't like where this is going. But they made the right choice, and they crossed the sea, and the enemy was destroyed. Do you know what the word crossed over means? Do you know what the word is in English? Hebrew, to be crossed over. That's why I call myself a Hebrew, because I want to be crossed over from death until life. I want to follow the Father every step of the way. And if he leads me down a path of destruction, then I'll be darned, I will die. And like Abraham thought in his head, I will kill my son if this is what you want because you made a promise to me, this is not my problem, you'll just have to raise him from the dead. And wow, that'll be exciting. Do you really believe in your God that much? You're willing to let him destroy you so that you could live. Let me ask you a question. What God do you really serve? Are you sure you serve the God of the Bible? I'm serious. We have come to a place in our belief system where we must make a choice. Some of you here for the very first time, online, maybe in person, you go, why am I here? Let me ask you a question. Let me tell you why. Because he brought you here so that you can make a choice. Everyone has a choice to make in your life. I don't care where you're at in your spiritual journey, you have a choice. Let me give you some advice. For those of you that your, your choice is pride, put it down. For others, it's bitterness, let it go. Life's too short to be mad. Follow his lead. He will destroy you, but he'll raise you back from the dead. You must be crucified with Christ. What does that mean? It means die every day. Make the choice to die to what you want, to die to what you want, to die to your ways. And watch him bless you like never before. Amen?
All right. That was only half, but we're going to stop there. Will you stand with me? And I'll read to you the last slide, which is some words that start with the letter Tet. Tov, which is good or goodness. Ta'am, which means to taste or discern. Tava, which means to sink down into teat, which is mire or mud or tuma, filthiness. How many of you have ever taken a blind taste test? You close your eyes and you put something in your mouth and it is your job to discern whether what it is and whether you should eat it or not. I want to put something on your taste buds tonight is the Father is going to chastise some of you. How do I know that? Because he prophetically chastised the crud out of me this last week, which means you're next. It's almost unfair because I didn't get to see it coming. I'm warning you. The Father has taken this ministry to a whole new level. He is requiring us. There is difference between sending out the call. The call, there's time. Then there comes the command. There's no time to decide whether I want to cross over to the other side or whether I want to stay here and play backgammon in the sand. You will be forced to make a decision in your life. I promise you, all across the globe, the call is coming to a close. People are going to have to make a decision which God they're going to serve. Is it the God of the New Testament or the God of the Old Testament or is it the God of the whole Bible? And when you make that decision, you don't even have to know the ramifications of it. You just have to make the right decision. He will teach you all things as you surrender to him. So some of you will have testimonies next week. But I'm telling you right now, there will be people that will go through real difficult times coming up. And it's for your good. Because the Father disciplines those he loves. If your life is peachy, beware. If you go through some tough times, thank him the moment you wake up in the morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that every day that we wake up, we can rely on you. Would you teach us how to pray? We don't even know how to pray. Humble us. Our pride stinks before you. There are days and times when I know that you want to give up on your people, just like you told Moshe. Moshe, get out of my way. Let me destroy my people. There's stench in my nostrils. I know there are days still, Father, that you must be weary of your people. Would you have mercy on us? Would you give us grace? We're trying to serve you. We want to know the depth of your love. We want to please you, Abba. We're not here to play church. We're here to be your bride and to be prepared for the coming of your son. Would you forgive us, Father, for our pride? Would you forgive us for our anger? Would you forgive us for all the things that we don't even know we're offending you? All the sins, intentional and unintentional. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We claim his blood before your throne tonight. Father, I pray for all of those that are abroad. All of those, Father. The thousands of people that are listening to this tonight. In the four corners of the earth. Father, would you let them know that they are loved? Would you let them know that they are not alone? that your power and your anointing extends into their home tonight. They do not have to allow the enemy to maintain a stronghold any longer. Father, give someone instruction to fast and pray tonight for three days to destroy the enemy in their home. Let it be confirmation that they heard that. And Father, for those that are here locally, I pray that you would anoint people that choose the right choice. Give them your right hand of power 
and anoint them for the ministries that you put before them. If I don't get to talk to anyone here tonight, Father, maybe it's the first time here, last time here, I pray you would give them what they need to accomplish your will in their lives. Break forth your spirit, your ruach inside of them so strongly they will see new things and new ways. Father, we submit and surrender to you tonight. We ask that you would bless your name in this fellowship, in our lives, and in our families, and everyone said, amen. amen and amen. You are now free to move about the country. Thanks for joining us at Passion for Truth Ministries. I'm Jim Staley. Come and join us as we travel back in time 4,000 years ago to discover exactly where the holidays of Christmas, Easter, and even Valentine's Day come from. Why do we celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th? Whose birthday really is on December 25th? Where did we come up with December 25th? Where did the star on top of the Christmas tree come from? Where did the Christmas tree itself come from? Where did St. Nicholas come from? Are we sure that St. Nicholas even existed? Have you ever wondered where the famous phrase, ho, 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 comes from? It comes from the late 1600s when they used to have plays and before the devil would come on stage, he would announce himself by saying, ho, ho, ho. Did you know that original Santa's elves weren't little guys that made toys, they were Krampus demons that would punish the children if they weren't good for that year, while St. Nicholas would give them gifts if they were good. Who is the Easter Bunny? Where do we get Easter eggs from? Why do we celebrate Easter on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox? Did you know that Christmas was illegal in the United States until the mid-1800s? Can we celebrate these holidays according to the Bible? This is by far the most popular video on the internet on the history of Christmas and Easter. This video has changed hundreds of thousands of people's lives and it will change your life too. Thank <laughs> you.